All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining the online forum tonight, um, where we're, we're speaking about um, Australia's first offshore wind zone and what that means for the Gippsland um, region. Um, so before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that we are meeting, um, obviously we're meeting virtually on Zoom, but all of us are on the country of First Nations people, um, wherever you're calling from. I'm calling in from Wurundjeri country, um, in the Kulin Nations, in Nam, otherwise known as Melbourne. Um, and I also want to pay my respects to elders past and present, and just acknowledge that, you know, the long history of First Nations people in looking after country, caring for, you know, the land, but also marine, marine animals and marine ecosystems, and that sea country is an important part um, of what Indigenous folks are looking after as well. And continue. Um, we're coming together today to talk about um, what um, Australia's first offshore wind zone means for Gippsland, uh, which is in eastern Victoria. Um, it's hard to begin this um, conversation without acknowledging some of the major events that have happened in the past week. So uh, last week, um, we had the news that um, AGL, one of the largest power companies in the country, um, has just brought forward coal closure dates for the Luoyang A power station to 2035. So that's 10 years earlier um, than anyone um, previously thought was going to happen. Um, so that, that obviously adds a lot of urgency to the changes that are happening in the energy system and the shift to renewable energy for you know everybody who um, needs to rely on electricity, but particularly for communities like the Tri Valley. Um, so I'm really proud that we've got um, Wendy Farmer, who's my co-worker, um, calling in from Gunai Kurnai country today. So um, Wendy Farmer is a Latrobe Valley local. Uh, she's uh, the Yes to Renewables Gippsland organizer, and she is also um, president of Voices of the Valley, uh, which is an imp um, community group that's been leading conversations on just transition for many years now. Um, We've also got some great speakers from the Maritime Union of Australia, who've been a really important voice in the ongoing campaign for offshore wind and just transition for workers. So we've got Emma Kane, who's a policy analyst at the Maritime Union, uh, as well as Aaron Moon, who's national organizer with the Maritime Union. So um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let each of you speak a little bit more about the MUA, but for those of you who don't know that the MUA represents workers in the uh, offshore sectors, oil and gas, um, shipping, um, stevedores, um, port workers, etc. So um, the MUA has been a really important ally um, in the alongside climate organisations when we're talking about climate solutions like offshore wind. I'm also really excited to have Shannon Hurley here from the Victorian National Parks Association. Um, and Shannon um, is, a, a, is a nature campaigner with the VNPA, um, you know, really passionate about um, protecting marine ecosystems. Um, she's just a total badass campaigner and it's been really lovely working, working together the last couple of years. Um, and Shannon's gonna be speaking a little bit about, you know, as, as these new industries develop, um, how do we make sure that we're baking in strong environmental protections um, so we're not doing any unnecessary damage to the important places and, you know, marine ecosystems that everybody cares about. I also realised that I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> um, I was too busy letting people into the Zoom room. And honestly, I haven't done one of these, like, public Zoom events in a while, so I'm a little bit frazzled. But my name is Pat Simons. So I coordinate the Yester Renewables campaign at Friends of the Earth, Melbourne. Uh, so Yes to Renewables is an organising collective. Um, our goal is to transform the en energy system so that it works for people and planet, you know, so that it's working for communities, workers um, and the environment. Um, we um, spent many years campaigning for a Victorian renewable energy target. And in the last couple of years, we've been really focusing on what the new offshore wind industry means for communities in the Latrobe Valley and Gippsland and how that can really help us act on climate change, but do that in a way that creates jobs and delivers good outcomes for regional communities. So that's a little bit about us. Um, 
I'll be facilitating the event tonight. Um, but before I do, I just want to, um, you know, give a little bit of an introduction about what is um, what is the offshore wind zone? What is this zone that we're talking about? Some of you might know that we've been campaigning on offshore wind for a, a couple of years. And a lot of that has been about trying to get legislation passed in the federal parliament to enable the industry to be set up. So a few years ago, um, there was only one major offshore wind project uh, that, that we were aware of publicly, and that was the Star of the South, um, some, a project that's captured a lot of people's imaginations and is really exciting. Um, but in order for projects like that to go ahead, there needed to be some regulations put in place, uh, which were passed uh, last year in the federal parliament, which is fantastic because it means there's going to be new power supply and options for renewable energy in regions like Gippsland. Um, but part of that is that the, the federal government has to basically create a way to enable projects to um, propose licenses and to propose projects in specific areas. Um, so if you imagine, you know, the, the waters around Australia, it's a very, very large area, the Commonwealth waters. Um, the, the legislation basically creates a way to establish specific areas where you're allowed to, you know, propose offshore wind or other offshore renewable energy projects. And the Gippsland region has basically been identified as the, the first region in the country where this will be set up. And so part of the reason we wanted to hold this event tonight is to talk about what it means for Gippsland, the opportunities and the challenges, but also because this is something that's going, you know, potentially will happen in other parts of the country. And so we, we wanna make sure it's done well in this particular place, but also ideally we wanna, you know, set the standard so that we're not seeing poor development happen or communities, um, you know, pissed off or um, um, not being listened to. Uh, so that's kind of the, the background for the event. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Wendy Farmer now to um, speak a little bit about uh, what this really means from a local perspective and particularly Latrobe Valley. So thank you, Wendy. Um, thanks, Pat, and thanks for the introduction. So um, I'm going to start off actually very early. So I was born in the Latrobe Valley. I was born in Yalorn, the town that was dug up for coal to produce the energy for Victoria, which I think is a really important part. I'm a local, you know, coal is in my blood. I Everything I knew was around the coal community. Um, but growing up in the valley, one of the things that, you know, as a child and even many adults still think that those clouds that we see every day are just steam. Sure, we see steam every day. I actually, as I look out my window where I'm sitting now, I'm about three kilometres from Yulon Power Station, but I know it's not just steam. I know that um, I see the pollution. I actually have the coal dust in my, on my garden, in my home. You don't get away from it when you live in the valley. So this community knows energy and we've done it all the time. Unfortunately, one of the things that this community has also suffered is the health impacts from the way that we've produced the energy for Victoria and the other states, of course, because we used to um, send it over across the waters to Tasmania, South Australia, New South Wales, and so forth. Um, with that, you know, guys, it's quite a known fact that guys will live approximately four years less if they live in the Trove Valley and females will usually live about three years less, two and a half, three years. So that's approximately. Um, we see lots of cancers, respiratory disease. Um, families told to let, take their kids out of the valley as they have asthma attacks and they take them out and it make, you know, it will usually resolve itself, but they have to come back in because they live here. And one of the personal things that has really impacted myself and my family is the asbestos that's been associated with the coal industry um, and the power stations. And actually it's hit, now hit the third generation for us personally in our family of asbestos. So I think now we're really in an exciting time to be alive. We're in, a, in the disruption and the transformation of um, the energy system. But that can also cause fear for communities like Latrobe Valley. 
what happens if, you know, we don't have enough energy? What happens with my job? Will my job be transferable? Will I have a job? Can I feed my family? Like all these questions come up when you start talking to the coal communities across regions, not just in Latrobe Valley, but I travel, a lot of my work involves going to other communities. And there's these questions about that energy and that energy transformation and, you know, will it be a fair and just transition? You know, what is a fair and just transition as we, you know, as we change? And I think uh, when we start talking about transition, transition's about a whole community move, moving forward. We're not moving away from coal. We've got a different way of doing things. And I often put it, um, and some that have heard me speak before, in the sense of a mobile phone. You know, we had a landline. We weren't pushed away from the landline, but not many people on this call would have a landline now. And look at what our mobile phone does for us now. Not only does it make those calls that the first mobile phone did, um, but it actually is our mini computer. There may be people on here now joining with their mobile phone. It rules our life every day. We do things differently. So when I start thinking about renewable energy, that's how I think. We're only on the cusp of what is actually happening with renewable energy. And of course, tonight we're talking about that offshore wind. Um, the possibilities for the offshore wind you know, it will play a major part in the energy production. People will say to us, well, why offshore wind? Why don't we have onshore wind and vice versa? But actually both of those um, winds are important because we have wind on land and sea at different times. Um, as Pat said, you know, this last week we saw AGL make a further announcement of a 10-year earlier closure. They made an announcement at the beginning of the year. Um, so about six months ago that they would close three to five years early. So I think we're going to continue seeing those announcements. And probably if you live in the Latrobe Valley and you see what is happening in the Latrobe Valley, you're probably not confident that they are the last dates, that we will get more dates about closures. We've got your lawn energy announced at 2028. You know, there is um, suspicion that they won't be able to even go that long. But at the same time, we've now got Star of the South, which would be Australia's first offshore wind ready to go at 2028. So we really are in this race now about what the future of energy is. Um, unfortunately, we've lost about seven years because we've had inaction of the federal government who didn't really want to look at reg regulations or legislation or declare zones. While there's been projects, only the Star of the South were able to go forward in their explorations. Um, but of course, we saw that um, regulations legislation passed last year just before the election. Um, at the moment, if all offshore wind farms across Australia were proposed, offshore wind farms across Australia would be built, we would have much more capacity than we do from coal fired power stations now. This is the greatest economic and employment opportunity that Australia has seen. And when um, I know there's other people that sit in. Um, some of the rooms that I get the opportunity to sit in. When we're talking to investors and um, people working on the offshore wind, they're saying they don't believe we will have enough people in our regions to actually fill the jobs. It's not because they're not skilled, because there are so many different jobs. And people will probably question that and say, but where are the jobs? It's all those on-flowing jobs that actually go with offshore wind. So that's really, really exciting. Um, we've seen the Victorian government set that ambitious offshore wind targets and really support the industry. And what we've seen there is industry jumping up and saying we're interested in that Gippsland zone as the first um, to be declared the first offshore wind zone. The opportunities for workers and communities and Latrobe Valley are really those manufacturing jobs, the, those outflowing jobs. And often we look at manufacturing in Victoria and we, we don't do a lot these days. The people in Latrobe Valley are very skilled. They know energy. They've played with energy for over 100 years. And I know we've got some of those people on this call right now. And they could easily pick up the, um, those jobs. Let's remember, though, that, you know, this is a workforce that has been given 12 years that their job will end. There will be many also that retire. 
in that time because many of them have been there 30, 40 years. So we're talking about the young people starting to pick up those manufacturing jobs. All the different skills that go with offshore wind, with, you know, Latrobe Valley now and Gippsland, well, even Australia, have to start looking at how we train our children for the jobs that we don't actually know exist yet. What are those jobs? Because as we build those offshore wind zones, we will see other jobs flow through. Um, there will be many community benefits, and I believe that we all can play a role in making sure that we get good community benefits for communities. So I'm not just talking about a football jumper sponsorship for a footy club. To me, that's advertising. How can we actually build community energy projects? How can we make the offshore wind industry support communities and make them resilient to the changes that we're seeing with climate change, that they're not cut off the grid every second um, storm that we have. And, um, you know, they really are sustainable in their own right. When I've traveled around areas, um, especially the Yarram area, Port, Port Albert area, I'm listening to communities that are saying this is the opportunity for their pub to be re reopened. This is the boost that their region has been waiting for for a really long time. At the same time, um, we do have concerns, of course, and actually tonight I probably took a three quarter of an hour phone call from a family that were concerned about what the zone meant for them, what the um, Aus AusNet and the grid means to them and how they actually, um, you know, go forward and the fear that it has created. And I think as we talk more and more about the offshore wind and understand that we have the opportunity to shape the way that the industry now moves forward, that as, as communities, as you know, everybody on this call, we can all play that really important part of shaping the future of offshore wind. I think one of the things that I really learned from the um, Gippsland um, Renewable Energy Forum we had a few weeks ago or a month or so ago, is when one of the unions spoke about if we continue to do energy the way we've always done it, or that we've done it in Victoria since the early 90s of privatisation, communities will miss out. So how do we make sure that we influence the industry that communities don't miss out? And how do we really get community energy projects up? And one of those great examples is Yekadanda, if people haven't unaware of that, where you know they are really on 100% renewable energy themselves. Um, neighbours will talk about, you know, what it will look like and what they can use. And that's very um, strong in the turbines off the, you know, off land, um, that boats, can I still do my boating? Can I still do my fishing? You know, is it going to ruin my view? Well, personally, I think that wind turbines, personally, I think wind turbines are really pretty compared to what how we produce our energy now. But, you know, all those... Um, Questions can be answered quite simply. And when we talk to the renewable, in, the, sorry, the offshore wind um, industry, we will be able to boat around there. We will be able to fish around there. And I'm going to leave the rest to the marine um, people on, the, on this. Um, one of the other things that these communities are often concerned about is they haven't been part of that energy. So while, as I've said, Latrobe Valley and, you know, this area has actually paid the price for producing energy. They've never had to produce it. So why should they produce it now? And it's really about looking at energy differently and saying, well, we've got this opportunity to do it cleaner. We've got it, the opportunity to do it better. And we've got the opportunity for community benefits in there. Let's make sure that we don't have environmental impacts or, you know, we will have, I know we will have, small environmental impacts. Let's make sure that we do it the best that we can. And we challenge decisions if we don't see that they're right. Um, we can't ignore the grid. And you know, a lot of people, and I, I know myself when I first started thinking about the grid and how the grid would work, it was like, of course, it's all got to go underground. That's just the way it's got to be. But as I start considering the environmental impacts from above ground and below ground, I think it's another discussion that we have to have. But once again, we need to be there to influence that. We need to influence the root of it. And we need to make sure that if there is any personal impacts from communities around, 
that we get good outcomes for them. So this is about bringing whole communities together on the journey of offshore wind. It's not just about one, one issue or the other. Um, I'm really looking forward to Shannon's um, presentation and of course the other speakers about, you know, that as we learn together about the offshore wind industry and together we can make changes. Thanks, Pat. Thanks so much, Wendy. Um, yeah, um, if, if we were in a room together, I'd be giving, you know, I'm sure I'd be giving like a round of applause. So um, yeah, thank you for that. And I just really appreciate, you know, the, um, your attention to what this industry means in terms of the opportunities for regional communities, um, you know, the, the jobs and the investment and, you know, rebuilding some, some small communities, but also addressing like some of the concerns that you're hearing on the ground. Uh, so I think that's really important. Um, I also just wanted to flag for everyone else, we will have a Q&A session um, after all the speakers have presented. So mm -hmm. if you've got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat as we go. Um, Millie, um, who's part of Yes Renewables, will, keep, will be keeping an eye on those. Um, so if you have, have any thoughts, feel free to jump in the chat and be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Next up, I'm going to pass to Emma Kane, who is a policy analyst at the Maritime Union of Australia. So uh, before joining the MUA, Emma spent 13 years working on board many different vessels in the offshore oil and gas industry. She represented her co-workers as a delegate and advocated on their behalf um, regarding women's issues, um, the well-being of workers, health and safety concerns, um, Emma has completed a bachelor's degree at the University of Western Australia, specialising in employment relations, um, law and society. Uh, so um, I've also got a little note here from, from Emma about, you know, the, the view from the MUA about approaching this. You know, we're facing a climate crisis. Um, the MUA is leading a strong campaign to support their members' transition into jobs and, you know, stepping away from hydrocarbons into renewable energy alternatives like offshore wind. Uh, Emma's role in this campaign is to ensure that oil and gas title holders remain responsible for disused property and that all equipment is decommissioned and removed um, according to relevant legislation. So earlier tonight, we spoke a bit about um, the transition from, from coal and what's happening with the coal-fired power stations in La Trobe Valley. But we've also, in Gippsland, we've also got the oil and gas um, industry in the Bass Strait, uh, which, you know, em employs many people. It's an important part of the, the economy and one that is also going through a transition. So just want to hand it over to, to Emma to talk a little bit about how what's happening with decommissioning of offshore oil and gas and what that means for offshore wind as well. So thank you, Emma. Thanks for the uh, introduction, Pat. <laughs> My name is Emma, as mentioned, and I work for the MUA. So we have about 13,000 members, and we represent a broad range of workers from courts through to divers, through to able seafarers, and many core crew working on the vessels off Australia's coast. So before I start on the Australia, I want to just give everybody a bit of a brief overview of the scale of decommissioning that's actually occurring or about to occur. Uh, off of the Australian coast. Um, so just some statistics came out from the voting recently that said we're decommissioning in Australia. And they've said that we're facing about $50 billion worth of necessary decommissioning work to be done on an offshore oil and gas infrastructure. And half of this needs to be completed in the next 10 years. This waste equates to about 5,700 kilotons. And if you can't get your head around that number, don't worry, leave it on. Coda actually said that that number is about seven Golden Gate bridges worth of materials or 17 high state buildings currently sitting off of our coast, disused and disintegrating. So now that we've got a bit of an understanding of what we're dealing with here, I'll just quickly run you through the legislation. Um, firstly, there's the Sorry, Emma, just um, the audio is just breaking up a little bit. Um, sorry, sorry, to, so, sorry to cut you off. 
Um, if you can just, yeah, speak a bit closer to the screen and maybe just enunciate slowly. Um, yeah, was, sorry, I'm not that sure why I'm doing that. Let Thank me know you. if it happens again. Sounding okay. a little bit better. So firstly, we've got the Offshore Petroleum Gas and Greenhouse Gas and Storage Act. And this is the legal framework that oversees offshore petroleum exploration and recovery in Australia. So this piece of legislation is um, administered by NOPSM, and that's the regulatory body that we primarily deal with when it comes to the emissioning issues at the moment. Um, the second piece of legislation we have is the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Protection Act. Um, this is so that work must be done in a consistent with principles that are ecologically sustainable, reduced to a lark, which means as low as reasonably practicable, and in a manner which the environment can be unacceptable. The third piece of legislation that a lot of people don't know about is called the Environment Protection Sea Dumping Act, and this regulates the disposal of waste if infrastructure is proposed to be dumped. A permit system is required if any form of infrastructure is abandoned, and that is if the, the piece of equipment is currently sitting there or if it's been proposed to be removed elsewhere within the field. So, because we're dealing with so many pieces of legislation and decommissioning is such a new uh, issue in Australia, um, some industry guidelines have been created uh, both by NOPSEMA and by DISA. Um, and this is just to help the industry and community um, understand the obligations that they have under the OPGGS Act. I'll get to those guidelines later, but I first thought I would introduce ESSO. So who is ESSO? Well, they uh, started producing gas back in 1969 and they've supplied over 50% of Australia's crude oil liquids and 40% of Australia's East Coast with natural gas. ESSO also booked $71 billion in revenue over the last seven year, years and paid $0 in corporate tax. Before I go into this campaign, the other thing I just wanted to quickly highlight to you is what an environment plan is, because they're a really crucial part of the decommissioning process. And it's important that everyone can understand that. So environment plans are available to the public. Anybody can go and have a look at those and they are on the not seen website. Someone there? Okay, all gone. Um, environment plans are basically a submission by, by the oil and gas property owner, which sets out the scope of decommissioning work, relevant legislation, including international laws, um, environment and the environment impact of removing or not removing equipment. And a decommissioning options assessment using this risk analysis is how works can be done and why. I guess the important issue here is that as per the regulations that I've just discussed, in order for an environment plan to be accepted, the title holder must be able to pr prove via this ALARP test that leaving property in situ or remaining on the sea floor is a better off environmental outcome than removing it. So, ESSO were issued a general direction by NOPSEMA back in May of 2021, and they were given 180 days to respond to this notice. The direction notes that decommissioning must commence no later than September of 2027. So this is the first campaign with other environment plans covering other equipment to follow later on. This campaign only covers steel pile jackets or SPJs, people might know them as, and we will see um, in 2023 the other environment plans for other infrastructure. So when SO received the direction, they did two things. The first thing they did was they created this 600 page plus document, the environment plan I've just been talking about. And in that plan, they covered options in varying degrees of how much of these steel pile jackets can be removed. They also did another thing though. They created a 10 page, really palatable, nice glossy document, which they've uploaded onto their website 
to the public and they've explained the preferences of cutting eight of those steel pile jackets at 55 metres below sea level and dumping the cuttings adjacent to the remaining fixtures. They even ask for public feedback. But what we've come to realise with this document is that it is very one-sided and only providing the public with this small document with all these beautiful fish swimming around these pylons and not explaining the detriment to the environment that these pylons can cause is a huge issue. So what the MUA have done is we've provided a submission and we've spoken to other unions and other community groups and environment groups explaining our issues of why we won't accept this, basically. We've argued two main points. The first is that platforms and equipment should be removed flush to the seafloor. There is no reason why anything should be sticking out of the ground, especially in a renewable energy zone. The second thing that we argued is that structures should be dismantled and recycled onshore in Australia, because that provides not only the right recycling facilities, but lots of jobs for people as well. So there are a lot of issues that we're facing with decommissioning, as you can imagine, with title holders trying to cut corners wherever they can. As I've mentioned, the first big issue is the fact that the infrastructure of this slippery camp and the Sydney Richland is sitting smack bang in the middle of this renewable energy zone. There's a real timing issue here too. If not have provided until 2027 for this work to be completed, yet we're expecting the renewable energy zone and offshore wind to start prior to then, what's going to happen here? The other issue we're really facing, which is a big one, is the onus is on the title holder to prove the outcome to leave property in place, that it delivers an equal or better outcome. And what that means is, is they're completing their own industry research and they're funding all of these scientists and all of these researchers to go and find statistics that prove that they should leave this infrastructure in place. How is that independent? What we're wanting is to ensure that any statistics used or any research used is independent and that independent research is put into these environment plans. Another big issue we're facing, facing with decommissioning is that wellheads are being abandoned but not being monitored. And we have spoken with a lot of experts in this field and we understand that sometimes wellheads do need to be left in order to provide easy access right into the well if there is any form of leaks. But if they're not being monitored, how do we know they're leaking? We have provisions within the legislation that state that there's this trailing liability provision that's just come out. And it says that any title holder will continue to remain responsible for any infrastructure. Right? But if these wellheads aren't being monitored, how are we going to put that responsibility onto the title holder? Another issue we're facing and a really important issue, we believe, is that the union has not been deemed so far relevant to speak to or be consulted on on any of this process, even though our members are the ones doing the work. So a lot of our members actually put in these, this infrastructure and these pipes and all of this equipment back in the 80s and 90s, and they want to see it come up and come up properly. And we believe they have the best, they're the experts in the field with the best knowledge, and they should be consulted and uh, spoken to and asked advice on when it comes to, you know, taking up this equipment, uh, the best possible way for the environment and the safest way for our members. I guess the last thing I wanted to touch on is that each time NOPSEMA approves infrastructure to remain in situ, it's, it sets a really dangerous precedence for future title holders to request the same outcome. So we need to continue to lobby government, speak with all these like-minded people and get them on board to ensure that this infrastructure is removed properly, safely, and not to the detriment of the environment. I guess um, in conclusion, from the MUA's perspective, more decommissioning doesn't just mean a better environmental outcome, which we are really thrilled to hear, but it also means that maritime workers have jobs to transition into as the hydrocarbon industry does die down and we turn to renewable energy op opportunities like offshore wind. 
Thanks very much, guys. And I'm sorry about there being a bit of an issue there. Um, if you want me to cover anything at the end, please just let me know. That's okay. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, great presentation. And yeah, just so interesting to, you know, really think about like the nuts and bolts of this, you know, there are existing projects in the water that, you know, they're going to need to be removed. You know, we don't want that impacting the offshore wind sector as that gets started up and slow, you know, we don't want that slowing down um, things on the renewables front. So yeah, really, really interesting analysis. Um, now, if anyone wants to see more info about like this kind of issue of the overlap of the zones, I've posted a link into the chat um, and you can you can actually see it graph, you know, visually where there is quite a substantial part of the area in Gippsland that it is currently set aside for these um, oil and gas decommissioning. So that's something of concern. Um, thank you, Emma. I'm now gonna hand over to Aaron. Um, who is also from the Maritime Union of Australia. Uh, so Aaron Moon is the national organiser for the MUA. He organises in various areas, stevedoring, seafaring, towage, port services and diving. Uh, and as an organiser, Aaron's been involved in the MUA's campaign for offshore wind for you know, many years. Um, prior to working for the MUA, Aaron was a marine line person in the port of Newcastle, where he worked on the wharves and he operated small vessels that assisted the mooring of ships within port limits. And during this time, Aaron was seconded to the Australian Council of Trade Unions, where he worked as a, a community organiser for 12 months before returning to the wharves. So um, it's really good to have Aaron here. And so I'll just hand over to you, mate, just to talk about, you know, offshore wind, what does it mean for, you know, jobs, workers transition and and the union's campaign. So thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Pat. And uh, <clears throat> thanks, Emma. I think Emma gave a very uh, uh, comprehensive overview of our campaign as to where it's at now. Um, uh, but just to uh, jump back a bit, like Pat said, I started my uh, working life actually in the port of Newcastle, which is the world's largest coal port. So unlike, also very similar to um, uh, Gippsland, Newcastle, uh, is centred heavily around coal or the production of energy uh, for the state of New South Wales. So um, I appreciate the fears and the, the hesitations that communities have around uh, around the transition and what it may look like. But uh, what I do know is that um, we started the conversation with our members. It must have been about five years ago, I think, and I, I was still a rank and file member at the time. Uh, and our union started a broad discussion around um, uh, this idea that we are we are working in sunset industries of being the if even if it's just uh, exporting coal uh, in the Hunter Valley or uh, our members that do work in the offshore oil and gas uh, industry now um, from Gippsland all up around to the the northwest of Australia of Australia. Um, so the discussion has been uh, ongoing for about five years around this transition and what it will look like, and uh, we've seen many examples of that in uh, various parts of the world. So Germany when they shut down their coal mines, offered um, uh, job guarantees or no force redundancies uh, or, or basically a lifetime pension essentially for uh, for their workers as they transitioned out to retirement. Um, the off, the off the coast of New York, I think it is, there's um, employment compacts with workers that are now constructing um, offshore wind uh, in those areas as well. And and we've actually seen some good steps made in Australia in Queensland where uh, only, I think it was a week and a half ago, there was a, comp a jobs compact signed with uh, Electrical Trades Union and the Queensland government that guarantees jobs uh, as they transition away from coal there. So there's some pretty great examples of how workers can be front and centre and involved in these transitions around the country. Um, it's great that we've had a very uh, extensive dialogue with the Victorian state government uh, and now the federal government as well as they have the uh, coverage of the offshore component. Uh, once things get about three k's off the coast, it becomes federal government uh, um, uh, responsibility. So there's been a constructive dialogue with the change of government now around that. Uh, there's still plenty of work to be done um, and there's plenty of tools that need to be given to workers to be able to ensure that transition. But uh, 
to touch back on what Emma was saying about the overlap in both time and space that we are seeing in this new offshore uh, energy zone, one of the one of the great things about wow. the, this um, is one of those online. Uh, one of the great things about that overlap, it does, well, it does create a little bit of concern uh, as to whether or not SO will do the right thing. A great thing about that overlap is it does provide us the ability to ensure that our seafarers that are already working out there now maintain their skills in connection with large plant that, you're, that will be almost directly transferable into the construction of the offshore wind. So that overlap will provide the ability for us to maintain those skills as we move into this uh, new economy with these new, uh, the new plant being installed. Um, and I'm, I'm regularly down in Gippsland, uh, well not uh, Gippsland, sorry, re regularly down at Barry's Beach, visiting our members now that are currently working in that offshore industry, uh, berthing at Barry's Beach every week, um, uh, servicing those, uh, the offshore plant that needs to be removed. And they, many of them live all throughout southeastern Victoria uh, and uh, will be benefit, will, will benefit from this transition if we can get it right. But um, uh, we just need to make sure that the state and federal governments come along for the ride and ensure that we uh, create the best system, which is the campaign that Emma's is working on now, to give us the tools as a union and as a collective workforce to be able to um, have some control over that. The other, the other thing I'd like to make note was something that Wendy said before about the um, the manufacturing of uh, the plant and uh, uh, wind, well, the, wind, the windmills and all the infrastructure that will need to be implemented to make this project successful. Uh, we've been very strong. And I think since, uh, I think it must've been pre 2019 uh, election, we came out with a, um, a, a just transitions document that uh, outlined a, a few key things um, that workers required back then to be able to ensure that we did get um, a, a just transition, a, a genuinely just transition and not just some lip service from government. Uh, but one of those was ensuring that we set up a manufacturing supply chain through uh, through the Gippsland area to ensure that there can be value added to the infrastructure that's going to be um, inserted or um, developed along the coast uh, there. So I think, I think that's all for me, Emma was uh gave much more detail about the technical side of it uh but the 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 key point that i want to leave everyone is that um providing workers are given the right tools uh workers in the offshore oil and gas industry are ready uh for that transition uh they're not scared of it but they want to know that there is some control and some assurities uh for them and their livelihoods moving forward thanks pat awesome thanks so much aaron and yeah, you know, like I think that really complemented um, Emma's presentation really well. So, um, yeah, thanks so much for talking about, you know, I guess that pathway of, you know, there's this issue of how we um, decommission the oil and gas rigs, um, but how do we get that pathway right so that, you know, workers can move from this part of the industry into this this new industry that's developing and for that to be smooth and not not cause too much pain for people. So. Yeah, that's that's really fantastic. Um, I'm just going to pass over to our final guest speaker, um, and then following Shannon's speech, we can get into a bit of a discussion and Q and A. So Shannon Hurley is a nature conservation campaigner at Victoria National Parks Association. Uh, Shannon's work focus on, focuses on protecting marine and coastal areas as well as other land focused campaigns. Shannon loves getting out into the field, visiting areas that need greater protection and working with local community groups. Uh, before joining VNPA, uh, Shannon worked as a campaigner protecting the Great Barrier Reef and has had several roles at Parks Victoria. So it's really, really nice to have Shannon here today to speak a bit about how, as we build offshore wind and particularly with looking at Gippsland, how do we put those strong environmental protections around um, the industry so that you know we're, we're really going for the best possible outcome so over to you Shannon. Thanks Pat you're doing a stellar job at the facilitation uh, just checking can everyone hear me okay before I continue great okay just let me know if there's any issues um, so yeah I'm calling actually from the other side of the state on um, in the Otway um, sort of Colac area of the Gulijan and Gadabunud country, but I spend a fair bit of time over Gippsland Way. 
So um, firstly, I just wanted to say um, how much the VMPA supports the move to renewable energy um, and transitioning away from fossil fuels. Um, and obviously, um, you know, a healthy climate is going to be good for nature as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we really support that. I guess our um, position is that we just want to make sure that it's not at the expense of nature and all the infrastructure and everything that is going in to help our climate is also um, not going to have, you know, disastrous impacts. Um, and so our, I guess, main sort of point here is really just to elevate um, the need to consider the protection of nature up front and early, up front and early um, in the process. And this is a really critical time to be putting this at, at the, you know, top of the agenda um, in amongst everything else that we've, all the other important issues that we've spoken about tonight. So I actually do have just a couple of slides just to support some of what I'm saying. So I'm just going to share that now. Okay. So just for those of you who can see the screen, does that look, can everyone see that okay? Great, thanks, Pat. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess really what, because the Gippsland area is just the first of many different areas that we are going to see offshore wind um, happening, um, you know, I guess it's really important that we do have a plan for how the impacts on our marine and coastal areas and also the land uh, is going to be minimised and avoided. And uh, I guess currently um, it hasn't been super clear for what this actually looks like um, from both the state and federal government. So we're just really hoping to elevate that early in the process so that because it's such a great opportunity to actually have some really big wins um, and really set the standard for Australia in the offshore, in this important offshore industry. So, um, and, and the way that this is managed going forward. So uh, just some of the concerns on marine and coastal biodiversity, I guess, that, that we have been concerned with, and we know lots of folks in the local community have been concerned with as well, um, you know, is the impact on migratory animals, you know, your whales, your birds, um, you know, your fish and um, both from the construction and from the ongoing operation. Um, and so also on underwater reef structures and, you know, there's important national um, marine national parks in the area and other really important conservation areas, you know, Ramsar areas which are recognised internationally. And so, you know, with all the marine biodiversity that lives beneath the waves and on the coast as well, there's a lot of uh, variety of impacts which, um, you know, this industry can have, such as above and underwater noise, you know, and this can obviously impact the migration routes of whales and, and fish and plankton even and um, all kinds of other marine life. Um, there's obviously the, the physical infrastructure too, which will be obviously the wind turbines and, um, you know, all the other seabed infrastructure, you know, what impact is, is that going to have on, you know, birds flying past on the migration routes of animals, you know, the breeding grounds of fish and, and things like that. Um, there's also going to be additional shipping and boating activity in the area, obviously, for the ongoing servicing of the infrastructure and the construction phase as well. Um, you know, the direct um, impact from wildlife and the wind turbines. Uh, there's also, you know, concerns for having all this infrastructure offshore dotted along our coastline, um, that that could actually just be a bit of a, a catalyst for the movement of marine pest species um, along the coastline, which, you know, marine pest species, just like, you know, rabbits and deer on land can actually cause havoc for our underwater marine systems as well. And then, of course, there's vegetation removal um, on the coast and on the land too. So those are just some of the impacts that we're concerned about. And I think a, a really good example from what we've seen so far, the Star of the South, which is you know, obviously the most advanced um, offshore wind project, um, has been doing some really great survey work to understand what those impacts are on um, our marine biodiversity. And I guess, yeah, we, we really hope that, um, you know, that will be uh, continued with the many other projects that are also proposed. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's all I wanted to cover for that slide. So then just moving on, I guess, in terms of with all of those uh, risks to the impacts to these such 
precious ecosystems. Um, there's a few different things that we would like to see, um, and I guess that requires a bit of collaboration between state and federal governments, and I guess is, you know, the best practice that we can. There's many other areas around the world which are even ahead of Australia, which are doing some great work uh, on this, um, such as um, in New York, and, you know, they've got some um, a really amazing master plan which sets out looks at all the different impacts across a you know, wind energy zone. And that actually informs before the project actually go ahead and you know, steers clears of certain areas which have got really sensitive marine um, high conservation areas, which is a really great, and I think we have a lot to learn from that. So I guess um, just to really step through really quickly what um, I guess the current sort of environmental um, assessment landscape kind of looks like and you know and I, I gather there's going to be a lot more work to be done in this space and it's not really clear about what that actually looks like now so hopefully we can all you know input into this process now um, with these public submissions to really in, inform that but um, essentially uh, as we have seen with the Star of the South which is um, you know well underway and doing their environmental assessment process for their project in Gippsland um, they usually have to, you know, once they go through all their processes of getting a licence and everything like that from the different levels of government, they, um, with this project, and usually I would assume that many other um, offshore wind projects would go through a similar process, is there's a couple of different environmental assessment processes at the state and federal level, and um, the proponent themselves or the company uh, once it gets to that point actually has to go off and do a lot of their own research and science and looks at these impacts and assess them and have risk management processes and things like that um, and that's done under state legislation and as well as federal legislation um, and I guess just to make a distinction just in case anyone's confused um, so uh, the common, uh, sorry, our state marine waters go to five kilometres offshore from the land, and then the Commonwealth waters extend from five kilometres outwards. Um, and so most of the uh, the wind turbines will, uh, I guess that what we've seen is the projects that are currently proposed or ones that are currently underway um, are in Commonwealth waters. So they're beyond five kilometres from, from the shore there. Um, but where I guess the state is often involved is because a lot of that construction, a lot of that, you know, subsea cables that, you know, that go and then connect to the transmission network, that's all in state territory. And so I guess that's where the sort of Commonwealth state um, collaboration needs to, to come into play there. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that was sort of clear, but feel free to ask any questions if that's not clear at the end. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, companies need to go through their own processes to prove that, you know, that they've looked at the environmental impacts and they're going to be minimised by doing X, X and X. And um, that is, um, from what I can gather, is, is the process which uh, has been assumed to, to occur going forward, that each company needs to do their own process. And um, whilst that is a, a really good um, thing for each project to be looking at what impacts their project would have, considering the number of different uh, offshore wind projects that we're talking about here and along the whole coast, we're just a bit concerned that there isn't um, any overarching framework or plan for how this impact on biodiversity will be managed or avoided across the board. And so um, one of the things that we're really going to be asking for is um, you know, for a, either a bioregional plan, so maybe that is for the, the Gippsland area here that it's proposed, or a statewide plan that actually looks at all the different projects, you know, that are in, in the pipeline um, and, you know, considers this on a broad scale and that for this to be actually led by government. So there needs to be some government leadership in this rather than just the different companies sort of, I guess, in charge of their own environmental assessments. So that's something that we would love to see going forward. Um, the other thing is that, um, as I mentioned with that New York example, is I think it's really critical uh, that there's some criteria developed to guide where these, the location of these projects, where they will go in the first place. And this is some, this is really important, I believe, one, for protecting um, our ecosystems from damage, but also to, um, really ensure I guess a bit more certainty to the industry too because you know if we know that there's 
you know, a marine national park in the area or, you know, a really critical high conservation value area or a breeding ground for whales or, you know, great white sharks, for example, like we shouldn't be proposing in this particular location anyway. So we would like to see up front and centre some criteria developed with like no go zones to give certainty to the, to the industry as well as protect the environment. And they could include, for example, no infrastructure through marine national parks or high conservation areas, breeding grounds, nursery grounds um, for important species like whales, uh, no construction during critical animal migration times. You know, there's particular months where this is really important. And obviously we understand this might be really difficult to coordinate, but, you know, we should at least be trying to avoid some of those times, you know, particularly with southern right whales who are, you know, uh, endangered species. Uh, and, of course, avoiding culturally significant areas is really, really important too. Um, you know, for the timing to, to coincide, and I've already covered off that one, um, you know, and other things like having a buffer around high conservation areas is also really, really important. So those are just some of the things that we think should be looked and considered up front and centre rather than um, a company proposing a particular site. And then you realise, oh, actually, there's this really significant habitat here. Um, it could actually save them a whole lot of work in the end, as well as protect the environment. So I guess I just wanted to relate it, um, all of that context really quickly to some of the processes that have been going on at the state level. And so the Victorian government have released um, a um, directions paper, which sort of, I guess, they're prioritising Gippsland as one of the areas for offshore wind to occur. And, you know, that's a bit of a roadmap that sets out, you know, how much they're prioritising, what they see as a bit of a direction for how to, um, you know, establish this industry. Um, and as an example, there, there wasn't really in that paper an identification of the importance of um, looking at this in a on a statewide context. Um, you know, there's been many mentions that companies would have to do their own environmental assessment and obviously be approved under state and federal legislation. But there hasn't really, from what we've heard, been talk of how to actually coordinate this on a bigger level. So that's something that we would really like to see. Um, and, you know, I guess an individualised process project by project doesn't really allow for the early identification of avoidance of important areas, we think. Um, and then at the federal level as well, obviously there's this, there's this uh, zone identified. Um, so, um, and the map that Pat and others have mentioned before, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty huge area and it does actually have you know, the, the area to exclude, which is the existing gas and oil titles. Um, but what we would really like to see and is an important opportunity for the federal government to really take a lead on this is some other important areas as well that are really important to avoid in terms of environmental significance. So um, there was avoidance of a federal marine park on that map, but it didn't really have mention of the state marine parks either. And so we just think that that's a really big opportunity that we really need to get on top of at all this early stage. So I might just stop sharing my screen there. Um, so yeah, look, I might leave it there. I think I've gone over my time. I think, yeah, really just our big point, just to recap, is that we just want to see early identification of important environmental assets that we need to be protecting and avoiding in the first place and a process around that and collaboration between the state and the federal level. So if, um, if anyone um, obviously shares those concerns, feel free to, to put those forward in your submissions to this federal process as well. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Shannon. Um, and yeah, really interesting point that you raised towards the end there around, you know, the we're seeing some conflict between, well, there's existing oil and gas in infrastructure, so that might limit where offshore wind projects. But if we're going to be limiting where new offshore wind projects are going, maybe we should li limit limit areas that we want to protect rather than be limiting areas that are already impacted by industrial development. So I just wanted to draw that that point out a little bit there. Um, but thanks so much for your presentation. Really important we we get this right at the start. So really valuable. Um, so that concludes the 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 presentations of tonight. 
we're now going to shift to a little bit of a different format, um, which is just a bit of a uh, an open Q and A for um, the speakers and myself. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions that have come up, um, you know, through the presentations, uh, please put those in the chat. Um, I I'm happy to just you know put one to to the panel. Uh, so some of the things that you mentioned that I think a, a number of people mentioned were, um, you know, the need for sort of like coordination, um, like leadership from government. Um, you know, maybe we want we want things to to work better, but they haven't quite um, happened yet. So just I'm curious to to hear from folks like, you know, what 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 do you think are some next steps in terms of increasing the ambition um, from government? And that could be state or federal. How do we how do we get them to take these issues more seriously, whether that's a decommissioning um, or or improving the the nature protection aspect of things. Would anyone like to have a crack at that one? <laughs> Emma. Pat, um, I should have actually mentioned, can you hear me okay? I should have actually mentioned that uh, the WA state budget did hand down $5 million to the Centre of Decommissioning in Australia uh, over here on the West Coast to, um, you know, begin the research that's going to be required for decommissioning. Um, so I do think uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, this new industry that will transition us into renewable energy, we to take it seriously. Um, it's just a matter of whether the regulatory body is going to um, adhere to the legislation or if we're going to have to you know, continue to hold them to account as well. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. And yeah, I guess a good example that yeah, governments can actually spend money on these things. And um, yeah, maybe we just with the offshore wind industry that there, there might be some new areas that we need we need governments to invest in. Um, I'm just seeing a question here from Jess. Um, okay. Just I think there's just the question from Jess. It's around you know like. Um, you know, we want wind energy because it's it's good for climate change, but, you know, being um, close to the Bass Coast, it's a really beautiful area. Um, how There may be some, you know, disturbance to, like, uh, nature and protecting the beautiful coastline. Um, would anyone like to respond to that, Shannon? And I could probably jump in with a bit as well. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to. I did actually mean to cover that and I just forgot. So thanks, Jess, for raising that, because I think it's a really important point and one that we'll be raising in our submission, too, is that, you know, there are certain areas where you just don't want to be seeing them like the prom. Um, and so, you know, I think, um, you know, as part of maybe some analysis early on, they could, you know, that could be a factor into it, too, where, you know, that is, um, you know, that infrastructure is kept away from, really um special i mean it's all special right but really um high profile or high tourism areas so that it's not just you know going to impact the coastline and the the natural heritage of these areas so yeah but definitely something to be considered in all of that yeah totally and just to just to add to that one of the things that um the, like the companies um have to do or if you know they're, they're currently doing is what's called like visual visual surveys so um basically uh a kind of representation of any kind of visual impact of the project uh so i know that star of the south um has um has actually made this available on their their website um and and that that basically enables you to to look at Okay, from this particular place, looking to the coastline, what does it what does it look like? Um, and that can actually help people get a feeling for like what is the visual impact um, on on special places, and allow allow people to to really get a sense of that beforehand. So I'd really encourage people if if that's something you're concerned about, um, particularly the Star of the South, I know has made that available. There are other developers. 
um, but that's that's something that's important to to look into. Um, okay. And then Noel says, how do you assess what's challenging visually and what's not? It's a really good question. It's really difficult to answer because, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and, you know, what, what may be a visual impact for one person, you know, someone say, might say that that impacts my perception of the, of the landscape, but another person might say, I think this is beautiful. So that it is subjective so to some extent. Uh, but there, there does need to be a way, particularly for reach, you know, places that are important for a lot of people, basically to enable the community members to have a say and, and shape, um, shape the projects. And projects can be redesigned, um, you know, if there's, you know, issues of major concern. Uh, there, there are ways to address these issues. But um, yeah. We need to kind of engage constructively because otherwise we can basically have no ability to, to shape the projects for the for the better. Um, so yeah, I would encourage people to to stay in touch. Um, these are things that you know I think Shannon and I have spoken about before um, that we'll be putting these some of these issues into our submissions to to the government as well. Like we do take it really seriously. Um, so I think that's being involved and continuing to raise the issues, particularly with organizations. Um, speak to the companies if you are if you um, feel that you would like to. And raising that concern helps basically inform them oh, we need to take this seriously. Okay, I'm just having a little look through. I also wanted to ask another question myself. Um, and this one's to Wendy. So, you know, Wendy, you, you'd be familiar a bit with uh, with some of the onshore renewable energy projects. You know, they have what these community benefit schemes that are that basically provide some kind of financial benefit to people that are neighbours um, or part of neighbouring communities, whether that's in the form of uh, royalties um, or um, sometimes like a, a benefit fund that can fund community projects. So I'm curious what, um, you know, with the offshore wind industry, um, it's a bit harder to draw the boundaries around who's the immediate neighbor or, or community. Um, how, how are you thinking about this and what would you like to see uh, in terms of the benefits to flow under communities in Gippsland? I think it's a really important question, um, Pat, because while we might, and I have heard it said before that, but you know, there is no close neighbours, it's people's backyard. That ocean and that beautiful pristine um, coastline is somebody's backyard, you know, we're, and it's a really big backyard. And I think, you know, we need to make sure that we do have those really good, and I spoke about it before, community benefits, where they are supporting communities, not just sponsorships, but real community benefits. How do they actually boost those regional communities that they work in? And I think, or I know it's some of the work that we're starting to do in um, Friends of the Earth, where we're actually looking at what community benefits we can ask for and how we how we present that. So if anybody has any ideas as well, we're very open to people speaking with us about what they see as really good community benefits. But we also understand that each community in each region is going to be a little bit different of what they need. And, you know, timing will also be part of that. So we're open to continuing that discussion and working with people to really look at good, honest benefits that build communities along the way. Um, Pat, but while I'm here, there is a question from Jeffrey, and it was how are we once again starting a conversation without the voices of traditional owners? And I think that's a really, really important question. When we come into a meeting, we recognise the traditional owners. Friends of the Earth are very keen um, and working with traditional owners in Gippsland, but I know that the projects themselves have um, traditional owner um, contacts and they work very closely. I know that um, Star of the South have got a couple of different um, traditional or quite a few traditional owner groups that they are working with and it's vital that we get it right and we must protect the cultural um, their cultural sites as well. 
So it's so important that we do work with traditional owners and recognise and respect what they need out of the offshore wind industry or any other renewable energy project. Thanks for that, Wendy. Um, there's just one last question. It's a bit of an abstract one. Um, and I think related to what we were just um, speaking about is how do, how do you define a community? You know, where do you, where do you draw the boundaries? Um, would anyone like to touch on that? I'd be sort of interested to hear from, you know, the, the union folks on the call, like for thinking about like, how does this industry benefit the community? How, how would you think about that? Um, I'll, I'll give it a go, but I, I think that the, the broader we cast the net with this, the better outcomes we'll see, right? I mean, it should be uh, like Wendy indicated, the traditional owners, um, I know that our uh, uh, National Indigenous Officer, Thomas Mayer, met with the Gunakuna people. It must have been pre-pandemic because we went down there, I think, in about 20, uh, late 2018, early 2019. And they were pretty keen to see some, um, uh, some outcomes that were more than just a painting being hung in the foyer of uh, the Star of the South if they were to open up and some tangible outcomes for uh, the, the local people down there. Um, but, I, but I think that the community should just be everybody that could be or may be impacted from it. And uh, the the broader the net, the more people we talk to, um, the more ideas that come into the room. And uh, eventually, um, uh, in my experience, no matter how diverse the ideas, we can always get to some collective point where either everyone's happy or everyone's unhappy. Um, and, and in this case, because we're moving forward and it's some good progress for our country, I think that there is the ability for us to <clears throat> speak to the local fishermen uh, speak to the local diving community, uh, the local bushwalkers, everybody should be involved um, from uh, the southern tip of this state right up the coast um, to, to ensure that there is beneficial outcomes for everybody and we can uh, build a, a sustainable and, and uh, in industry that will assist us in the future without damaging our environment as, as much as practical or possible. Awesome. Thanks so much, Aaron. I think it's, it's a, sort of hard to beat that. I, like, just a really good response here. Like, you just, like, touched on touched on all the issues um, and, yeah, really appreciate bring, bring everyone together. Um, I might cap it um, on the, on the Q&A um, aspect of tonight. Um, so thank you, everyone, for your questions and great responses from, from the panel as well. Um, so just to give a, a little bit of a um, indication of some next steps. So at the moment, the, the offshore wind zone has been proposed for Gippsland and it's currently under consultation. Uh, so uh, I believe Millie's just going to pop in a link to the consultation process. Um, would really encourage people to, to make a submission if you can. Um, yeah, didn't didn't have a, a pre-prepared submission to to share with you tonight, but we'll be we'll be preparing ours in the sort of last few days um, before um, the consultation finishes at the end of this week, and we'll be sharing that um, with our supporters as well. But definitely, the the top things that are going to be in there for us for Friends of the Earth is you know how do we make sure that these really important climate solutions um, deliver you know good outcomes for workers. The community and nature so hoping to really bring all of those things together and would really encourage you to um to do the same in your um in your submissions if you're keen to make them uh, i'll also put my email uh in in the chat if anyone uh is putting a submission in and you want to and you know need a hand or you want to just have a yarn you can email me and we can i'm happy to to talk to people about that um because yeah like Aaron said the more ideas the more sharing you know the better outcomes we're going to get and yeah that's that's about it thank you everybody uh for tonight thank you to our speakers um for making the time um you know out of your busy schedules and and coming along at night um yeah really appreciate it and it's just so great to have uh you know people from the union movement, uh, climate movement, local communities, nature campaigners, like in in the same room talking about these issues, um, and yeah, we're we're all sort of impacted, and you know we can work together by um, to try and get the best outcomes possible. So I uh, really appreciate that.
All right. I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up and smiles. Thanks very much for that, Pat. My pleasure. Okay, thanks everyone. We'll call it. Have a good night. Thanks everyone. Bye.